Hi guys, Mr. Pulley here, this time looking at ancient Rome for history of Western civilization at Fieldcrest. Going to look at things from the Republic to becoming an empire to its fall that, as if you watch the video, might have lasted until about the 1500s. So let's take a look at this. Okay. The Romans are greatly influenced by the folks who came before them, the last unit we looked at, the ancient Greeks. Okay, The Greek influence can be seen everywhere. They adopted a late Greek lifelike art style as opposed to that idealized, beautiful, perfection kind of style they had also. They borrow from them in their architecture the idea of columns we talked about, those three orders of columns. Uh, they also invent arches, which they then arrange into domes, but I've got a little bit on architecture coming up later on in a separate video. Engineering-wise, these guys are absolute experts. They invent roads that are still used today. They have bridges that are still used today. Uh, they are the first to work with concrete on a large scale. They also create these aqueducts. And aqueducts, these are big channels and bridges that help bring water to the cities so they can have a supply of fresh water. Uh, which is constantly running through fountains and drinking uh, systems uh, all the way through their sewage system. Uh, great engineers. Okay, uh, The roads, this idea is to help move goods for trade, to improve trade, but also our armies. Our ability to move our army very quickly allows us to be a very powerful uh, empire later on. Um, also, that provides security. That provides security, improves trade because it's safer to trade. All these things work together. Adolf Hitler copies this idea. That's what's referred to as the Autobahn, which is not just a single road in Germany, but a system of roads so he could move his troops around based on the Roman idea. And then Eisenhower, the head of the Allied troops uh, in Europe during World War II, sees this, likes the idea, copies it later when he becomes president. That's now our interstates here in the United States, our interstate highway system, now referred to as the Eisenhower Interstate Highway System. Okay. Science-wise, much of this is left up to the Greeks. Uh, later on, they will become part of the Republic and the Empire. Uh, they copy the same types of ideas with poetry, history, and philosophy. Lots of things based on models set earlier by the ancient Greeks. Okay. They do, instead of using Greek language, they do adopt Latin from their Latin neighbors. Uh, this becomes sort of their universal language. However, Upper class Romans will stick to using Greek to show that they are educated and more cultured. Okay. What's this up here in the corner? Well, this is the famous statue of the twins, Romulus and Remus, who, uh, according to mythology, were the founders of Rome, the two twin brothers uh, who were raised by a she-wolf. Um, Romulus and Remus are trying to decide out of these seven hills which hill to start the city on. Uh, they can't agree. They get into fight. Romulus kills Remus, starts it on a hill, eventually spreads to the all the seven hills and names it after himself, Rome. Okay. Again, with this Greek influence, uh, they copied the phalanx, that fighting technique, but they add some changes that improve upon it. Anytime you improve upon a military technique, that gives you an upper hand. Okay. One of the things they do is they divide their army into a smaller, more mobile groups. And these mobile groups are referred to as legions. Okay, and the legions are made up of landowners who are in the army. And the reason we want landowners are these guys are actual citizens. They have more to lose if something happens to the Republic, and hence they have more reason to fight for the army. Okay, those guys who serve in the legion, these are legionnaires, Roman soldiers. Moving on, let's look at our, some of our social classes at the top. The very tip, tip, tippy top are the patricians. These are the upper class landowners, the one percenters, if you will. Uh, extraordinary amounts of wealth, uh, extraordinary amounts of land holding, especially later, especially later in the uh, Republican Empire. Uh, they will have that. The people who are their representatives will be the senators. There's a 300 member Senate. And then a council, usually sort of like our executive, usually more than one of those to keep a little balance going on there. Uh, these guys serve for life, and children can inherit the title. In fact, we talk about Brutus later on. Well, Brutus inherits his title of senator from his father. The lower classes, well, these are the plebeians, or the plebeians. Okay? They want some equal rights. Hey, we fight in the army. We need these things. 
And so one of the things they get is this law of the 12 tables, which means basically they get the same set of laws applying to everybody instead of one set of rules for the patricians and another set of rules for the plebeians. Okay. Later on, they will get representatives called tribunes. These are the officials for the lower class, the plebeians. Today, from the Roman system, we use words like uh, veto, I forbid, the system of checks and balances of power, all ideas we've adopted later into our government. Now, the lower classes got their rights the same way they did in ancient Greece and Athens, refusing to fight. Oh, you don't want to give us any rights? Guess we won't fight in the army. How's that going to work for you? Let's look at uh, one of Rome's greatest expansion time periods, the Punic Wars they have with Carthage. Uh, the first Punic War against Carthage, this was an attempt by Carthage to seize the Strait of Messina. This is um, the strait between the boot of Italy and the island of Sicily, which is southwest of Rome. Let's pull up our map here so you can see this a little bit better here. Okay, here is Rome of the time, not even all of the Italian peninsula. The strait would be this little body of water in between the tip of the boot and the football that sort of is Sicily. You can see half of that belongs to Carthage. Well, they're going to try and close off that strait. That's a threat to Roman shipping. Rome then, of course, at attacks. Uh, they win the war, and in doing so, they will take over not only all of Sicily, they will also take over Sardinia and Corsica, these islands over here, starting their first major expansion, uh, and they will force Carthage to pay them an indemnity, uh, damages for the war effort. Uh, this is not going to make them happy, and it's going to lead to our, oops, let me get over here, sorry, our second Punic War. This is the one with Hannibal and the elephants you read about, right? Okay, Hannibal attacks by land. It's hard, but it's a bit of a surprise. Let's think about this. Here we are. Let me get this up here so you can see it a little bit nicely. Okay, instead of attacking here from Carthage and going over Italy, he marches all the way across North Africa, up through Spain, over the Pyrenees, over the Alps. Yeah, we always hear about how many elephants he loses in the Alps, but the Pyrenees are no cakewalk either, trust me. Okay. During the Second Punic War, he attacks by land again. It's much harder, but it's a surprise element for them. He wins several battles, including the major battles, like the Battle of Cannae we talked about in class, where literally, depending on the accounts you read, 40 to 50,000 Romans are killed. That's a huge number. Um, Scorpio, uh, Scipio, excuse me, counters not by reattacking him. The Romans are kind of exhausted. They've got to rebuild their armies. But Hannibal, from his whole march and his victories, is exhausted as well. And he runs around winning some victories and losing some others. Scipio counters by attacking back at his home base over in Carthage. His capital is now threatened. The leaders in Carthage call Hannibal back. He's got to return home. He's defeated the Battle of Zama. He's leading troops he doesn't know that well. He hasn't trained and hence gets a defeat. Okay, that leads to the Third Punic War, which I'm going to call a bit of a mean-spirited thing on the part of the Romans. Carthage was still a trading nation uh, empire, not nearly as powerful as they were before, um, that they're not really a threat to Rome at this point at all. However, Cato the Elder, uh, a well-known statesman in the Roman Senate, wants these guys destroyed, sees these guys as still a threat. Uh, the idea that they're still around is just annoying to him. So they take uh, a minor treaty violation and then they use that as a pretext for having a war. Um, Scipio the Younger, not the, the elder who attacked and, and beat, Han beat Hannibal in, uh, Car outside of Carthage, he attacks. Carthage is completely taken over. They destroy the entire city. It's razed, it's burned. Some say it's plowed under. Some even say they salted the fields around there so no one could even come back and rebuild it and be able to plant any crops there. Whether that happened, hey, it's history, pieces missing, pieces added, fake ones, we don't know. Okay, all the inhabitants of Carthage taken prisoner, the ones that weren't killed, and sold as slaves. I told you, a bit mean-spirited. Ah, uh, here we go. Now we're looking at the Rubicon here, okay? The river that Julius isn't supposed to cross, okay? And on his way to Rome, let's get to that story here and some of the things that lead to the end of the Republic. The Republic will begin to fail and fall. The Empire will begin, okay? You always ask, I always rather ask students, you know, to name a Roman emperor, and they almost invariably say Julius Caesar. Well, technically, he's not one of the, not the first emperor, but we always refer to him as a Roman emperor. He's a great publicist. I told you, you want to be famous, have a good publicist. He himself was his own publicist. Famous, okay? Words attributed to him, including Vini, Vidi, Vici, I came, I saw, I conquered. 
Okay, he's a well-known guy, okay? He's told after his triumphs in Gaul, what is today France, don't cross the Rubicon, okay? Because we see him as the threat. He does anyway. Why does he do that anyway? Because he can, and he can because he's so popular, because he's been such a good publicist, plus giving away lots of free grain and breads and goods to people. People love him. Well, they sort of counter him by putting him into a triumvirate, a ruling group of three people, thinking that the two other guys can kind of balance him and keep him in check. Okay, that doesn't work out. He gets rid of a couple guys uh, and, and, and defeats another one. Uh, or gets rid of one guy gets, who sort of retires and defeats another one and becomes a dictator. He also then, so we talked about, they added all these additional senators and things to sort of weaken the power of the Senate. This makes the Senate unhappy. And then the idea of Brutus and Cassius. These guys lead the senators who will stab Caesar those 23 times uh, to kill him. Uh, the famous line, supposedly from Shakespeare, of et tu brute. We don't know. Again, if we look at it in Greek, changes completely with those educated Romans speaking together each way because maybe he's saying, and you, son, we don't know. So looking at Octavian, Octavian is part of a second triumvirate. He is Julius Caesar's adopted son. I'll get into that in a bit more in a, a bit later. He, just like Caesar, will push the other two leaders aside and take the new name Augustus. Hey, we want to know that one also from the study guide. Should have highlighted that for you. Sorry. He takes the title not of emperor, although later they will give him the title of emperor. He'll just sort of ignore it. He's emperor already. I don't need a title per se. He takes a title of princeps or princeps, calling himself, I'm the first citizen. Of all the citizens, I, I, we're all equals. I'm just the first amongst you. Okay. So a little bit more about Augustus. Here he is looking like one of those great Roman gods, uh, Greek gods, rather, uh, a little more lifelike in his face. We can see a very powerful figure here being shown. He is the grandnephew of Julius Caesar, who was adopted, as I said, by Julius. He works to kill Julius' assassin, so too bad Brutus and Cassius and others. Okay? He becomes a princeps, again, that first citizen. He rules from 27 BC to AD 14. It's the end of the Roman Empire, or excuse me, Roman, the end of the Republic and the beginning of the Empire. He finds Rome, he says, a city of bricks, rebuilds it, and leaves it a city of marble. After the fall of the Republic, now we have our empire begin. Okay. We have a time period referred to as the Pax Romana. This is 200 years of relative peace and stability in the Roman Empire. We have, during the Julio, Julia Claudians, uh, this includes Julius and Augustus and some of the people following after them, some good emperors and some bad emperors, but during the Pax Romana, a period of good emperors and 200 years of relative peace and stability. Okay? This series of good emperors ruled during this time period, uh, and these are guys who are seen as great leaders who expand the territory. Uh, some names to look at are Hadrian, Marcus Aurelius, lots of others they mention in your text as well. However, problems are going to begin. We've talked about this idea of power corrupting. Well, we're going to see that with turmoil and emperors. After the Pax Romana, we're going to have a series of very bad emperors, many of these kind of bad, uh, some ruling for a very short time. You may recall in the book, uh, in section uh, four, talking about uh, time periods with 44 year, or 49 years and 22 emperors, eh, not a good time. Okay. Again, this idea of power and wealth can lead to corruption. Uh, we see also that not just in government, but also in society. The Latifundia, these are large estates that are self-sufficient, run by those very wealthy one percenters, so to speak. Um, their success hurts small farmers. Sometimes they're cheating them out of the land. Sometimes they're loaning them money and then foreclosing on them and taking their land. Well, these small farmers now no longer have land. They're landless farmers. They move to the cities. This is bad not jobs for them, uh, housing is shoddy at best, but we try to take care of them, a little excess going on there, entertainment, all you can stand, 130 days of holidays during a school year, uh, we've got gladiator contests at the Colosseum, races at the Circus Maximus, trying to keep these guys entertained so they're not causing any trouble. Well, some clever generals come along and recruit some of these guys, instead of land owners to be in uh, legions, they recruit they recruit some of these guys themselves, they are now loyal to that general because it's the general who's equipping them, training them, uh, offering them payment and land if they're successful. And so they're loyal to that guy and not the Senate. 
At first, the Senate's happy because they're getting rid of the homeless people or the land, the poor people they're having to support. On the other hand, they are now a power threat. The army also later on will become very much less and less uh, Roman, and we're actually going to have Germans hired in as mercenaries to fight for us, which is a bad idea when the folks you're usually trying to keep out happen to be Germans as well. So here's the growth of our empire at its largest stage. This is where we're going to stop for this particular video. Um, as you can see, we've got all this territory, most of Western Europe, all of Italy, all of Greece, uh, into Turkey, down through Jerusalem, most of Egypt, all the way across North Africa, including what used to be Carthage, uh, into uh, the islands here of Great Britain, uh, all the way up to about this line right here where the guys over there were such barbarians. We built a wall all the way across there by this guy, Hadrian, said we're sick of seeing these guys. <laughs> they paint their faces blue and they run around naked in battle. It's kind of crazy. Those are the Scots. So Marcus Aurelius, just want to add this quickly because uh, I don't have the clip. thought he did. Okay, Marcus Aurelius is seen as one of the great emperors, a last of the good emperors by most accounts. Uh, he was seen as a philosopher and an emperor, which was what one of the Greek philosophers said, hey, we should have a philosopher king ahead of the government. Well, he's not a philosopher king, but a philosopher emperor. Same kind of idea. That's Marcus Aurelius. Hey, that's on the study guide. Hey, by the way, you've been paying attention. 22 of the 33 questions answered in this video alone. See you next time.